The countdown continues of the 20 greatest games of the last 50 years. Tonight, we take a look at a game that began under a full moon on Halloween night and ended in November. And Joe, you've had some dramatic nights at Yankee Stadium. This one has to rank among the more amazing ones. Uh, amazing, dramatic, and the fact that it came after 9-11 made it the most memorable. And here we go. It's number 12 on the countdown. Okay, number 12 on the countdown is Game 4 of the 2001 World Series at the stadium. The Yankees and the Diamondbacks, Joe Torre, who managed it, Tim McCarver, who helped Joe Buck call it, have joined Tom Verducci and me. And, Tom, you could take up half the show with just the backstory leading up to this. Oh, remarkable. You have to start with 9-11, Bob. Don't forget, this is only 50 days after 9-11. The wreckage actually is still smoldering down at ground zero. People weren't sure how to feel when they went to the ballpark. Tons of security around the ballpark, around the stadium. But for three hours or four hours, I think people got lost in the moment. And Joe, only the night before, President Bush, in one of the high points, really, of his presidency, had strode to the mound at Yankee Stadium, a lot of tension, threw a perfect strike. Didn't matter, Democrat, Republican, people were lifted by that moment. It was, a, I mean, you could feel the heartbeat in that ballpark. It was, it was remarkable. And again, you know, I think we put baseball in perspective. Uh, and we, we did a lot of uh, visiting down at Ground Zero and, and the staging area. And we realized how important baseball was because even though people were grieving for their, their loved ones, they were, you know, were interested in the Yankees and, and mm -hmm. wanting, to, uh, wanting to have us go play baseball. It's one of the few times probably, Bob and Tom and, and Joe, that uh, two managers calm down the president of the United States because the next night Bob Brindley told Joe Buck and me that uh, that the president was about as nervous as any public figure he's ever seen. <laughs> it's true and there was one other thing there's always a meeting in the umpires room before we start any postseason series and I'm shaking hands with all the umpires and I'm, this one umpire didn't look familiar to me. As it turned out, he was at home plate, too, and he was dressed as an umpire, but he was a Secret Service man. Oh, boy. Wow. And, you know, in retrospect, it may not seem this way, but that night, people came to the stadium. They didn't know if they were in the safest place in America because of all the Secret Service and all the security, or given everything that had happened just recently, whether they were in a very dangerous place. That's right. And to get back to your point about President Bush being nervous, I think he was nervous because Derek Jeter told him before when he was warming up in the tunnel, <laughs> That's true. don't bounce it because if you do, they're going to boo you. They're still Yankee fans. The heat was on. <laughs> Could you sense, Joe, even though there are lots of Yankee haters all around the country, that at that moment in time, there was a lot of sympathy for the Yankees and people who otherwise wouldn't were pulling for you? Well, you know, right after we came back to start playing ball, we played in Chicago against the White Sox. And uh, in the stands, uh, you know, I love New York, there were signs, placards. And then, you know, knowing that they had saying, uh, you know, New York, New York up at Fenway. So, you, you, you know, you had a sense that, you know, we represented more than the Yankees at that point in time. I remember one of Joe's comments, uh, a quote after the Oakland series, saying that, uh, that you could hear the fans breathe in Oakland at the Coliseum. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was just so different. Uh, you know, baseball has been my life. And, uh, you know, you get so enveloped and, and really oblivious to everything that goes on around you. I think 9-11 slapped us back to reality. And uh, we realized that we should appreciate every freedom and every opportunity we have to, to breathe and, and to, to be a part of something. Now, just in a baseball sense, this was a remarkable season for you guys. You're going for your fourth consecutive world championship. Would have been your fifth in a six-year stretch. You come from down 0-2 against Oakland, the Jeter flip. Then on to the LCS, the Seattle Mariners, kind of lost to history, had won 116 games. You didn't just beat them. You blew them out in five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we just we felt we were a club of destiny. And the thing that I, I was very proud of my clubs uh, is the fact that even though we did accomplish something the year before, 
we always felt we had something to prove, and I, I think that was really important for us. Joe's teams had won 14 of 15 postseason series through the 2001 ALCS and coming in to this World Series. On the other hand, the Diamondbacks, an expansion team, grew to a championship team in very short order. Well, they did, and they did it by spending money. Normally, you think of an expansion team as a bunch of young guys trying to earn their way. This, as you know, was a veteran-laden team that knew how to win. They were in the top ten in payroll. Actually, it was the second highest payroll to this day in Arizona history. Now, they did it on a credit card, and the, debt, the bill would come <laughs> later. But for now, you're talking about a very accomplished team, even if it's the fourth year in franchise history. Okay, let's take a look at their lineup. The Diamondbacks are ahead two games to one. They won the first two games in Arizona. The Yankees came back and won a close game in game three to tighten up the series. So they go with Womack and Council, who had been a hero in 97 for the Marlins in the World Series. Luis Gonzalez, who had 57 home runs that year. Durazo is their cleanup man in DH. Matt Williams at the back end of a great career is at third base. Then you got Finley, one of the best defensive center fielders in the game at that time. Sanders is in right. Mark Grace, a chance for a ring, hooking on with the D-backs late in his career. Damian Miller is the catcher. And Kurt Schilling on the mound. Here's the lineup that Joe Torre put on the field for game four in 01 at Yankee Stadium. Derek Jeter, you'd moved him around. You were shuffling your lineup just trying to get something going. Yeah, he's the igniter. I mean, I remember the, the year before I put him in the leadoff spot in, in game four of the World Series. He had a home run first pitch, and, uh, you know, I, you always look for him to start something because you trusted him so much. Paul O'Neill and Scott Brocious would each be playing their last few games in the major leagues. Uh, there was, we, we, we knew this. I mean, we knew that Paulie was going to walk away, and uh, it was... Again, you get so lost in what you need to do that you really don't allow all the emotions to creep in. But when you had time to sit back and, and take it all in, you realize that, uh, you know, we were trying to accomplish something very, very uh, special. And here's the pitching matchup. Schilling for the D-backs, El Duque, Orlando Hernandez for the Yankees. Now, because you won the LCS in five, you could have moved your rotation around. You could have moved Clemens up. You could have done anything you wanted, but you stuck basically with the rotation that had been in place after the LCS. You went with Pettit and Messina the first two games. You know, we, we really had four, go with four guys, and we mm -hmm. weren't going to do, like if you have, you know, you're talking about having Schilling and Randy Johnson, sure, you're going to find a way for those for those pitchers to pitch as often as possible. Well, we didn't have, I don't want to say that we didn't have that luxury, but we had four guys who we felt were, you know, were able to win a ball game. Tim, because the D-backs had also finished off the Braves in short order, Bob Brenly was able to put his rotation together, and he went old school, just like your Cardinal teams would use Gibson 147 in a series, or the Dodgers if they could, unless Yom Kippur got in the way, would use <laughs> Koufax 147. He was going to go shilling 147. That's exactly right, and ultimately pitched Randy Johnson in relief in Game Seven. But uh, so much was made uh, of the fact that I, I remember New York headlines in some of the papers: No way can uh, can uh, Bob Brenly start shilling with only three days rest. I mean, uh, you know, 40 years ago, they did that all the time in the World Series, but it is a rarity now. It was the first time that Kurt had done it That's in right. his career, which made it mm -hmm. a bigger That's issue. True. He's deep That's into true. his innings over the course of the year, and Brendley made the announcement after the Game 3 loss that, okay, now I'm giving the ball to Kurt Schilling. I think he planned on that all along, but Kurt also lobbied for the ball as well. He wanted this game. Yeah. Schilling and Johnson started five of the seven. And, sh and Johnson showed up in relief in Game 7. Yeah. So they pitched a huge percentage of the innings in this, in this series. They wound up getting 59% of the outs in this inning for Arizona. Amazing that they were, were Koufax and Drysdale yeah. in modern times. If you've I got can, an I, ace or two of them, you might as well play it. I, I can remember, uh, Joe and I were talking about this coming over. I can remember uh, a single pitcher dominating a World Series. Gibson did it. Actually, all three that he pitched, Koufax did it in 63, 65. I can't remember where two pitchers dominated a World mm -hmm. Series like, uh, like a, a guy who would start three of the seven games. Well, one of those two is on the mound for the D-backs in this game, but as we pick it up in the top of the first, it's El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, set to work. The leadoff man, Tony Womack, steps in for the D-backs. Tim is working the game with Joe Buck. Womack up the middle. That's his first hit of this series and a good start for Arizona. Tony Womack is on now one out of 12. Here's Council, a useful guy. And, the bunt. and he's going to buck. Base side, barehanded pickup. Great. First nice inning play. Bunt, Joe. Well, what you talk about, when, when you got Schilling 
and Randy Johnson. You play for one run because one run sometimes, I mean, that's a, that's a tall mountain. I said, I think uh, in this replay that Scott Brocious was the best I had ever seen at the one hand play where you come up with the ball, you have to come up with the, the ball in the throwing position. I, I've revised that uh, since I said that. I think Scott Rowland's the best I've ever seen, but Brocious is, is right behind him. Brocious, you talk about going from Oakland and, and coming to New York, and, and he played big for us. Hmm. Luis Gonzalez with that open stance. Not a promising start here. Hernandez hits Gonzalez, and then Durazo, the cleanup man, is next. Well, I mean, Duque, he, first of all, has to find out where the strike zone is. So he's going to play with it a little bit off the plate, in the inside, but he obviously wasn't very sharp early because he normally can thread a needle, but he wasn't at that point yet. Still having trouble locating his pitches to Arubiel Durazo, the cleanup man. Yeah, and, and again, he'll glare in at the umpire on occasions, too, because uh, that's just his style. The plate umpire is Ed Rapuano, and he's going to figure in this game. And Durazo, he was the, one of the secrets, you know. He just comes off the bench. He's uh, hit the ball the opposite way. Left-handers don't seem to bother him. Strong. Ball four to load him up. So now it's Matt Williams with the bases loaded one out. Full count. See, he wanted that pitch for a strike right there, and that pitch is inside. Bases loaded, one out, and a 3-2 pitch. Two out. And, and right there, you, this is where you know Duque is pretty proud of his stuff because, uh, you know, he went strength against strength there and, uh, and one out. So now it's up to Finley. Yeah, that is a vintage El Duque inning. 27 pitches. He's out there for 16 minutes, and there's a zero on the board. Well, now you know why I lost hair. <laughs> <laughs> to the bottom half, and Schilling works to Jeter. Jam shot, caught. Womack, one away. Womack with a leap, and he makes the grab to retire Jeter. The, the Diamondbacks, it was clear, were trying to wear Derek Jeter out inside. The whole series. Yeah, well, you know, Jeets always wore something on his hand because he got hit in the hand so often. Uh, but, you know, in order to neutralize him, especially with the power, and of course his parents were always there, always excited. Uh, but he always, uh, you know, never backed off. He always dove into the ball. The night before, I would imagine he stopped by your office and said, Mr. Torrey, big game tomorrow. Yeah, I think, let me see, 2001, he may have gone Mr. T at this point in time. He was starting to abbreviate it at that now, point. Joe, to face Schilling, I thought what you really needed was a lip reader. Because, Kurt, when the batter is not looking, watch this, outside. He likes to call pitches and location to the catcher by mouthing the words or a little flip of the head. In fact, that hurt him in a couple of innings, and you'll see that play shortly. He makes a constant habit of that. Normally mm -hmm. gets away with it, but as you mentioned, not always. No. And, and we saw it, it's, it's certainly. But the one thing I remember Sandy Koufax saying, it's not the pitch you're throwing, it's where you throw it. And if you, if you hit your spot, it really doesn't mean a whole lot if you know what's coming. Check swing, ground ball, Womack. Well, what you're seeing here is the polar opposite of El Duque. Normally, you have to put money into a pitching machine that work the way that Kurt Schilling is working right here. In this inning, eight pitches, eight fastballs, eight strikes. There's no mystery what he's doing. Well, the, the fact that he's pitching on three days rest, which, you know, obviously uh, was, was talked about a lot. We don't know it at the time. But if, if you're going to pitch on three days rest, you're going to be economical and try to get as deep into the game as you can. And that's the only way you're going to do that is to keep your, your pitch count down. And Schilling smart enough to figure that out. Sure. Got him on the outside corner. And there goes Bernie Williams looking overshadowed by Randy Johnson, who struck out some ridiculous number, nearly 400. Schilling struck out nearly 300 batters in 2001. It's remarkable. Between the two of them, they pitched, you know, nearly 600 innings. So it wasn't just a postseason workload that they carried. It was the entire season. And the fact that we saw, you know, Schilling when we played interleague and he was pitching for Philadelphia. 
Uh, he's a dominant pitcher. He takes the ball and he says, you know, I'll be here at the end of the game. And for the most part, he was. In fact, uh, you would see Kurt Schilling uh, some more years in the rest of this decade. Mm -hmm. I, I think I remember that. <laughs> By the way, Schilling, 4-0 and in that postseason coming into this game. 11-2 and in the postseason for his career. Now, you can talk about overall career numbers where his victory total may not match up with some Hall of Famers. But for me, that fact alone, that postseason fact, those big games, memorable games, that should send him to Cooperstown. Loves the spotlight. In fact, after this first inning, he comes off the mound and he says, that's one. He's starting to count the outs that he needs to win the game already. So first inning in the books, El Duque had to work out of a jam. Schilling breezes one, two, three. When we come back, why is Orlando Hernandez so upset? You're watching MLB's 20 greatest games, and this is number 12. This is game number 12 in our countdown of the 20 greatest games of the last 50 seasons. It's the Yankees and the D-backs game four of the 0-1 World Series at Yankee Stadium. Top of the third now, no score. Top of the order again for the D-backs, Womack against Hernandez. It's 3-0 on Tony Womack. No, you lead off hitter, you don't want to walk him, right? You don't want to walk him. That, that, I tell you, he had to fight himself out of some jams here in this ball game. You might have thought he had settled down after a one, two, three second, but now he's having location problems again, and he walks Womack to open the inning. Yankees expect a bunt. They have Brocious way in at third. When you hear about the 2001 World Series, the, the primary guys you think of for the Diamondbacks, Schilling and Johnson, but Tony Womack, a big hit to get them there against the Cardinals and and then throughout the World Series uh, uh, consistent play. It's not a good idea to run or to bunt on the first pitch. Give the pitcher a chance to get wild as he was with Walmart. Bunt to third perfect. Brocious gets to use the glove this time one out. Another sack bunt by Council. Again, they're playing small ball early, and it makes sense. It, it makes sense because you got the middle of this batting order coming up, and you, you're certainly not going to walk anybody intentionally. They have a lot of left hand hitters in that lineup. Quite unintentionally, Hernandez has fallen behind Gonzalez now. Well, he refuses. I mean, he refuses to give in. I mean, it's just flat out you refuse to give in, you know, when that strike zone changed from being a little wider than it, than it used to be. Uh, you know, he was still going to test the umpires to see how, how much he can get away with. Yeah, I think, Joe, there's one issue in terms, obviously, the base open, don't give in. But a four-pitch walk to Womack, and I thought in this at-bat with Gonzalez, he's not really close. As much as he wants to yap at Rapuano behind the plate, these pitches are missing by a lot. Oh, there's no question, Tommy. I'm, I'm not saying at this point in time that he's, that he's picking. But, uh, you know, he just hasn't had his rhythm yet. But even when he is on his game, he's going to try not to throw the ball over the plate. Two on with one out for Durazo. Durazo skies one to right. Womack's going to go back and tag as O'Neill makes the catch. So they're going to have runners at first and third now with two out. And at this point, El Duque has had it with Rapuano. Missing inside, and now Hernandez is in the face of the home plate umpire. This has been brewing all in it. And Ed Rapuano is going to go all the way out to the mound and get in the face of Hernandez. See, another pitch that's not really that close, in my view. That ball's three or four inches inside. Stay off my pitcher, will you? <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's, he's coming off the left side of the mound and when you look back to the inside part of the plate you know you, you're you're looking at what you want to see not mm. necessarily what what is actual and Rapuano tells him that ball was a foot inside now he added another adjective in there but he clearly didn't like El Duque showing him up well I'll tell you Eddie Eddie's a good guy uh, you know he'll he, he has uh, you know a little bit of a short fuse but he is fair. He's not looking to throw anybody out at that point. In time. You, you can't argue balls and strikes. What did you guys talk about? Well, I just said, you know, I'm just trying to get him to pitch a ball game. Let's just, you know, not get him uh, excited here and, you know, just understand the passion that goes on in, in playing baseball, especially in the postseason. So now it's Matt Williams. He hits it hard, but Brocious stays in front of it, knocks it down, gets the force. So the D-backs have stranded five guys through the first three innings, but it's still a scoreless game. So it's Shane Spencer now in the bottom of the third for the Yankees. Nothing, nothing. 
And a ball outside. Now Schilling kind of pauses and that draws the reaction of the crowd here at Yankee Stadium after not getting that pitch from the home plate umpire Ed Rapuano. This crowd knows Ed's here. They were on him during the break. This is a fastball because Schilling said yes I like the pitch. No I don't like the location. It's probably be a fastball away to Spencer. It's a bad habit for pitchers to get into. Spencer deep to right. Gone. One to nothing New York. You know there are times when you look up the word prescient in the dictionary and there's a very flattering photo of Tim McCarver. <laughs> you were on that Thank one. Thank you. Thank you. Well it, it was what Tom was talking about earlier. Uh, when, when a pitcher's on the mound, sometimes they don't even realize it. Uh, they, they shake, yes, for a fastball. No, I don't want it there. Yes, I want it there. And, and after Schilling came back on the mound, he actually leaned his head to the left as if to uh, tell uh, Damian Miller, his catcher, I want it outside. And we talk about that. A lot of pitchers do that in the major leagues. They don't even realize they're doing it. And you got to understand that at every breaking ball is implied. For instance, a slider is low and away to a right-handed batter. But a fastball is the only one that where the catcher wants to know the location because that location is in or out because mm -hmm. your, your catcher is moving. So this is a fastball. Yes, I want the fastball. No, I don't want it there. Yes, I want it there. Whenever you see that uh, from a major league pitcher, you always know it's going to be a fastball. How do you disguise that? Uh, you don't. And, uh, you know, the, the young pitchers that I used to catch, I'd say, you know, I can see that, but so can the hitter. Mm -hmm. And they can figure these things out. I mean, hitters are not dumb, but, uh, but particularly if you're throwing that particular pitch to the opposing catcher. These guys are paid to give signs. They know what the signs are all about. Plus, plus, there are some pitchers that instead of shaking will just stare at you. That's and, true. And then you'll change your, your sign. So, uh, you, you know, you try, you, you try to keep from getting into any kind of a pattern. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of it, with the hitters, you know, you have a right-hand hitter hitting the ball down the right field line like, like Shane did. Uh, the fact that you always want a left-hand hitter in the lineup at Yankee Stadium, but, you know, when you have a right-hander it can hit the ball the opposite way, it's... it's it's so valuable, and you know Shane Spencer, uh, you know obviously showed it there. All right, Kurt Schilling after the Spencer homer got the next three guys: Brocious, Soriano, and Jeter. So he gets out of the third, and the Yankees lead it one to nothing. Back with the fourth after this. Continuing with Joe Torre and Tim McCarver and Tom Verducci, it's game four of the 2001 World Series. It's game number 12 on the countdown of the 20 best games of the last half century. Arizona down one nothing, top of the fourth. Steve Finley leading off against El Duque. Right here, and for the third time in the four innings now, for the Diamondbacks, they've put their leadoff man on. Finley is on with his second hit of this series. Another leadoff base runner. Well, I mean, you, you talk about that lineup up and down. They had, you know, they had speed. They had, uh, you know, experience in, on both corners, center field. Uh, it was uh, it was a good ball club. Sanders grounds one to short. Six four three as Sanders grounds to Jeter. And and just very subtle. Uh, Duque makes a pitch, you know, because they they're used to him throwing a lot of. You know, pitches down the middle, you know, in, in, in situations, and there he was, makes a pitch up and in, and he gets a double play ball. It's a nice turn by Soriano. Would have been even nicer if he was actually on the base when he had the ball, but it, it was, was close in the neighborhood. enough. <laughs> uh, why quibble? And what's important here now is that Grace comes up with two outs and the base is empty. Grace gets into one to right. This game is tied as Mark Grace hits it into the upper deck here at Yankee Stadium. A 1-1 game in the fourth inning. I haven't talked to Mark Grace uh, about that home run, but that had to be one of the hardest balls he's ever hit. Well, again, if you're Duque and you're sitting here, don't walk him because he's not a home run hitter, and 3-1, mm -hmm. uh, and, and he just, uh, just let it out. 
Uh, he was floating around the yeah. bases there. Mark hit home runs in 25 different ballparks from Wrigley Field all the way to the Tokyo Dome. But I'm sure that one was like nothing else in his career. A World Series home run at Yankee Stadium. All right, now we're in the fifth. Still a 1-1 game. And here's Womack, a thorn in your side the whole series. With the speed, good play by O'Neill, but he beats it to second. Yeah, we, we couldn't make a, a – I can't say we couldn't make a quality pitch because you're going to make him hit the ball because he's not a home run hitter, and he, uh, he hit a lot of balls down the line. That situation right there was a baseball purist dream. Good hitting, good base running, great play by O'Neill, great short hop tag by Jeter. And Womack, knowing the ballpark, busted this from the very first step out of the batter's box, and that's why he's safe. And that's where doubles are spawned in the batter's box, not on the bases. So Womack is on, and Craig Council knows for sure what they're going to ask him to do because he's been doing it all night. <laughs> and, and for many years before that. Sacrifice bunt number three. But Martinez almost turns it into an infield hit or an error, but he's managed to right himself after falling down, and he gets the out at first. Well, I mean, Tino, right away, he's going to be aggressive, try to throw the runner out at third base and realize Womack is just a little too quick for him. It wasn't didn't make any sense and he just kept his presence though because he could have panicked and he didn't do that. Situations like this I think El Duque will try to get Gonzalez to go after a ball not a strike. Shallow left. Spencer will they test it. Womack is coming. Here's the throw. Out to the inning. One of the remarkable plays by Jorge Posada. I thought initially that he tagged him with the glove with the ball in his right hand. But as the replay shows, he did tag him with the glove, but the right hand came spinning back to tag him in the lower part of the back. This, I, I can't tell you how good a play this is because it's an in-between hop. It's the toughest hop for a for a catcher to handle and I think that the most common refrain that you hear is an outfielder's got to hit the cutoff man and the reason for that is if he doesn't if he throws it too high it's going to be an in-between hop for the catcher and those are the toughest to field well it is but in Yankee Stadium both lines are very shallow so you really eliminate the cutoff man because you can reach the catcher hmm. but uh, and, and you know catcher we're both catchers you get that ball in the bare hand because if, if you happen to be slid into and uh, it could knock the ball out of the glove but if you have it in your bare hand you have a better chance of holding on to it but it's separated and you're right I mean I thought Rapuano made a great call I did too because he did tag with the glove and then you see him you know tag him in the, in the side there with the with the bare hand the, the one thing you learn at a very early age is that the catcher's mitt is not a mitt designed for slap tags, not like the fielder's gloves. Mm -hmm. And you can tell by the way Posada handled that, right. that ball. Former infielder. Yeah. With very yeah. good hands. And also, Joe, once again, Shane Spencer. You got to believe he's got a little bit of a better arm than Chuck Knobloch. I'm not so sure that Knobloch gets the out at the plate in that situation. Well, you know, Knobby was, it was interesting. He couldn't throw the ball from second to first, but he, he was pretty good once he got in the outfield. But again, you're right. Arm strength, I think, uh, for sure, Sh uh, Shane had a better, uh, better and arm strength. obviously, from the jump here, the whole series, Bob Brenly's going to be aggressive. He's got Womack, who's very speedy. Even though it's a shallow fly ball, he's going to make the Yankees make the play, and they did. Well, I don't think there's any question. You, you have to make the opposition make a play, especially when, uh, you know, if, if it's nobody out, I, I think it's questionable sending them. But with, with one man out, you have, to, uh, you have to try to score them. Just go through any major league season and think about the times you see an outfielder throw any runner out at any base. Mm -hmm. Not often. You know, often I think the third base coach or the manager will say, well, I don't know, it was 60-40. If Ted Williams is the hitter, You've got better odds or lesser odds than 60 40. Mm -hmm. With, if it's going to be the last step, it's going to be a two out situation. Make them make the play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not, it doesn't happen often enough. No. And, and again, you know, in that situation, it's not like you're throwing it from right field, you're throwing it from left field. So really, the base runner is in the way of the throw that you're trying to make to the catcher. And, and you know, if he throws it right on the plate, 
you know, the chances are it could it could hit Womack while he's sliding well, in. Well, you think about that play once again. Posada on the inside part of the of, of the home plate, inside part of the third base line. Womack sliding away, and that play tag with the mitt, and then having the hand follow. It was, a, it was just a remarkable play. And, and it's the catcher's job really to line up with which side that the ball is going to be on. So mm -hmm. he's got to adjust to the to the outfielder's arm at that point. So it's a pulse pounder <laughs> already, tied up at one. Up next, what led to this moment in the Yankee dugout? You're watching MLB's 20 Greatest Games. Joe, Tim, Tom, Bob, game 12 in the countdown. Still tied as we go to the bottom of the six. Scott Brocious leads off facing Kurt Schilling. Brocious hits one to center. Finley stumbled going after it. At the wall. Off the base of the wall. And Brocious has a leadoff double. Okay, so Brocious has the double, and now Soriano comes up, and the question is, will you sacrifice? Yeah, we're bunting. I mean, at this point in time, we want to get that, that lead run because uh, Sori just swings and misses too often. And a strike on the outside corner to Soriano. First, I want to say, now it's 0-1. Is he still bunting here? Again, that was a long time ago. But I, I, I still, you know, want that, that runner to third base. And when you're sitting next to Don Zimmer, you know we're bunting at this point in time. So he showed Bunt took a strike, then either missed or ignored the sign and had a swinging strike. Now he's got two strikes, and let's see what he does. Out of the Bunt, he fouls it, and he strikes out. That's a terrible play. Awful. Joe Torre can't believe it. You can see that. So what are you telling him? Well, I'm asking him more than anything else, and, and it sort of escaped me. I remember running into Bernie because I was looking at some of this video ahead of the show. And because uh, if you're going to see here, first of all, you know, you, you don't want to bunt with two strikes. I can't take a bat out of his hand at that point in time. But I think he got confused. He knew the bunt sign was on, but then uh, he, he, just, he just lost it, really. So now Jeter with a runner at second, one out. To the right side for Grace. To the bag, two out. And now with a runner at third, two out. Paul O'Neill. Slow roller. Grace to Schilling. Got it. And the inning is over. Schilling barely gets to the bag in time. And as you'll see on the replay, Tim, his foot isn't down at first. He's got a double tap. We thought it was a bang, bang. But uh, Schilling with the right foot could not find the bag. And a typical O'Neill reaction. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> That's an unusual reaction for Paul O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> so by just that narrow margin, it's still a 1-1 game. The Yankees might have gone in front on that. Well, again, you want to get that uh, that run to third base. We're less than two out, and I have Jeter coming up next. And um, unfortunately, we had a little, uh, you know, malfunction with, with Sori and never got the – you don't get that many opportunities against the Schilling or Randy Johnson. So when you don't get a bunt down – and Soriano was able to bunt. He had three sacrifice bunts that year. Those things are costly to it with the offense that you have where every base, especially against Schilling, is well, big. Well, when, Tommy, when you consider the fact that now you're in the other dugout with the other manager, what does he do? Does he play the infield up, which pretty much he has to play the infield up, which enhances that hitter, especially Jeter, who, who's, who knows how to hit with men in scoring position. Uh, and he's not trying to pull the ball, which really, you know, is, is tough to defend. And, and so it, we had an opportunity to score a run there that uh, who knows, you know, what could have happened from there. I remember asking Don Zimmer uh, more than once, uh, forget about the power, the easy way to, uh, to score runs. What's the most important part of an offensive ball club? He said base running. It, it, to me, you know, when you, got, when you make contact, uh, when you have a little speed or at least are aggressive on the base pads, that stuff doesn't go in the slumps. You know, to me, when you get to postseason, it, it's not the guy that hits 40 home runs is going to beat you. It's that other guy that's going to beat you because it's not how far you hit it in postseason. It's how often. Another and, guy that doesn't go into slumps is a guy you had in the bullpen to end games. That's Mariano Rivera. The best ever. Well, he was our Randy Johnson <laughs> shilling. The only thing we had to get to him when it meant something. Somehow I think that somewhere in the countdown, we may see Mariano Good later thinking. in this series. But directly <laughs> ahead, this play at the plate. Next on MLB's 20 Greatest Games, we're at number 12.
Welcome back to game number 12 on MLB Network's countdown of the 20 greatest games of the past 50 years. This one is tied 1-1. It's game four of the 2001 World Series at Yankee Stadium. We've reached the top of the seventh. After getting Reggie Sanders to ground out, Orlando Hernandez faces Mark Grace. It looks like it has taken him about 75 pitches to really start throwing. Effectively, as he misses high with a fastball, 3-1, and one, struggling early. And again, we got a 3-1 count again. That's what the home run pitch was on. I think Joe Bug just said only 75 pitches to this point, and he mm -hmm. had 27 of those in the first inning. Hernandez issues a one out walk to Grace. The fourth walk of the evening. And again, in his defense, he had an up and down year for us because he didn't win many ball games. And uh, even though he was a threat to pitch a good game all the time, he really wasn't as sharp as he normally is. And he nicks Damian Miller, so now it's two on with one out. A little bit worried here, Joe? Well, you know, you're just trying to know when to pull the plug. And uh, at this point in time, you know what he's capable of. But again, you don't know if this is the beginning of the end. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, you got left-hand hitters coming up, you know, made the decision pretty easy to bring Stanton at this point. You know, there are key errors by infielders and outfielders during the course of the game. They never talk about a pitcher making an error. That was an error by Hernandez hitting Miller. So he's gone. Stanton comes in. Stanton was always a useful guy out of the bullpen, but at this point, he's kind of at the peak of his career. He made the All-Star team that year. Well, Mike, Mike Stanton was one of those guys that maybe ability-wise, he doesn't impress people, but when you put him in tough situations, he comes up big. He faces Womack here. Two balls, two strikes, two on, one out. It'll be tough to turn to. Jeter in the middle. Get the ball. Well, that is a great turn with Womack Oof. running, isn't it? Oh. it? It has to be clean. There's no question about it. Otherwise, you're not going to get the double play. So now the bottom half, and it's Bernie Williams starting it off. Here's the 0-2. They hit. Opposite field single. So there's Williams, the go-ahead run on the bottom of the seventh. Tino Martinez. And he draws the walk. And even though the pitch count isn't high here, you, you realize when Schilling, you know, walks someone or hangs a splitter, that's a sign of maybe he's getting a little fatigued. And the bullpen is going to get up for the first time. Actually, BK Kim is the one who gets up. But Schilling will stay in to face Posada. Williams, Martinez on for New York. Posada trying to bring them all. Double play ball. Council to Womack. On to first. Runner at third. Two out. All right, so Williams to third. Schilling not out of it yet. David Justice will come to the plate. On the outside corner, 0 and 2. 98 miles per hour. Now, this is a huge sequence for Schilling with two on and nobody out. He actually started throwing harder in this sequence at any point in the game. You can see him go into his reserve tank for Posada and Justice. Well, I think when Georgia hit into the double play, it really got the adrenaline flowing for him. So David Justice, who had a lot of big moments in the postseason during his career, to this point in this World Series, eight at-bats, eight Ks. And how about the velocity from Schilling? I thought that was a real big sequence there. He started with two runners on, nobody out. He starts throwing harder than at any point in the game. You can see he's really going to his reserve tank in what was really a high-stress inning. Remember, He's two weeks away from turning 35 years old. He's at 297 innings for the entire year, mm. and he still is blowing it up there at 97. Wow. I wish we could make a case, uh, finally, that a pitcher pitching on three days rest as a starter is not necessarily going to have his arm fall off after six innings. Well, plus <laughs> the fact when you're pitching in, no, in, in October and it turns out to be November, that you're not tired. You know, teams are out of a race in September, all tired. But when you're in a race, you find that other gear, you find the adrenaline, uh, you'll get through it. Okay, so we're still tied. 1-1. One, one. After getting Craig Council to fly out, Council just happy he got to swing and not sacrifice. Mike Stanton now <laughs> faces Luis Gonzalez. Into center field he to pokes one in the center for a hit. Williams over to cut it off. And so even though this is just a 1-1 one, one game, it's not that there haven't been a bunch of scoring threats because there have. You mentioned last night, Durazo hit five home runs coming off the bench this year for the Diamondbacks. 
12 home runs overall, and he gets into one to center. Williams back on the run, can't get it up against the wall. Gonzalez around third. Gonzalez to the plate. Poor throw by Soriano. Gonzalez is safe. Durazo holds it third, and the Diamondbacks lead it two to one. So Stanton couldn't get those lefties out. Well, he has trouble getting the ball away from the left-hander. I think if there's one shortcoming with, with Mike, is that ball stays on the inner part of the plate and Durazo knows what to do with it. And then this is what baffles me because I don't know where Sori was throwing the ball here. He threw it right at me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so now Zimmer you got to cut off, man. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pull Stanton now. I had to pull Stanton. I, I needed the right hander to pitch to the right hander, and Mendoza is a ground ball guy, so we're trying to just uh, basically minimize the damage here. But he's not a strikeout guy, so it's likely the ball's going to be in play here. Well, yeah, yeah, but he can strike people out. He's got a, he had a great power changeup. A 1-2 to Williams to short. Cheater, what a play, and safe as Posada dropped it. Bob Brenly, one of the more aggressive managers in the major leagues at sending his runners on contact. And, and that's where the, uh, the Diamondbacks excelled all season long. Love that play, Tim. He put the pinch runner in, Midre Cummings. They had the contact play on, put the pressure on the infielders. And frankly, Jeter just didn't make a good throw. Tough play, thrown off the wrong foot. That's but true. You had to be perfect with the throw, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't there. Especially well, with Cummings running. Good play to field it and hit right at him. When you play the infield, and that's what you hope for. But there was no margin for error on the throw. Yeah, it, it's applying pressure. It, there's no question. When you know the opposition is sending their runner, and you know that even in between pitches because you'll watch them at third base, it, it applies pressure. You, you know you have to make an exchange, quick exchange, and then make the throw to the the plate because the catcher is the one that's the victim here. He's going to get nailed at the plate unless he gets the ball ahead of time. When you have a runner like Cummings, it's tough to do that. So now you're down a couple of runs, and a couple of runs, a big hill to climb in this game. Oh, well, I mean, we were not scoring. Uh, I mean, we, we weren't hitting. We weren't putting men in. We weren't really threatening a whole lot. So, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking about being down uh, three games to one at this point. Yeah. And, and plus, Joe, we talked earlier about Mariano Rivera. He was not a factor in game one. Arizona won nine to one. He wasn't a factor in game two. They won four to nothing. And now you're two runs down. He becomes less of a factor in this game. Well, I mean, the fact that we had to pitch him two innings the night before. And, mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, that takes a little bit uh, of thinking on what you're going to do, except that we're here we are. You know, this is... The World Series, you know, with all hands on deck, and Mariano is certainly the first one that raises his hand. All right, now Schilling has a two run lead. Do you expect to see him go back to the mound? I do. Uh, I do expect Schilling to go to, go to the mound uh, again. Kim hadn't pitched either, you know, because uh, mm. just because we didn't use our closer, they weren't in a position to use theirs either, and uh, he had done a good job. Well, that's what Joe Torre is expecting, but it's Bob Brenly's job to make the decision. And it was a controversial one. That's when we come back. Uh, that's enough. That's enough. No, no, uh, listen, you're at 88 right now. We got BK locked and loaded for the last six outs. Man. Let's, let's, you know, you're a hero already. Okay, so clearly Schilling wants to stay in the game. No, no, I'm fine. And Brenly's telling him we got BK, Young Young Kim, locked and loaded, ready to go. You've thrown 88 pitches. That's enough. Well, I mean, for me, uh, I don't care if they're bringing in Christy Mathewson. I mean, I, I'm happy that Schilling's out of the game. I mean, because, you know, yeah, we hit the home run against them, but, uh, I mean, we really didn't do a whole lot of threatening. I think that's one good gauge. If a manager in the other dugout can think about the, the manager where he's bringing in a pitcher, if he can ask himself the question, would he like it if, if the – situation mm -hmm. were reversed and, and I think if the situation were reversed what you're saying is you'd go with Schilling. I, I would go with Schilling because he was dominant although you know when, when you're sitting there in that dugout and you see some things like the hanging splitter and the, the ball four uh, you know you may see a little leakage here and, and mm -hmm. again when you have your closer uh, who hasn't pitched in the series so he's fresh. He can Why pitch not? two innings. Yeah, and, yeah. and he's done a good job. I, I, I sympathize with Brenly here. It's a tough call. Schilling, as he mentions, is at 88 pitches, not a high pitch count. 
But I, going back to that seventh inning, he really had to expend himself to get those last two outs. We saw him get up to 97. You wonder how much he then has to get back again. And as you mentioned, Joe, Kim has not yet to pitch in the World Series. He's anxious to get him out there. He was tough to hit. He had the lowest batting average against among all relievers in the league. He feels good about the guy he's bringing in the game. Well, there's no question. And, and watching him throw the ball 97, 98 miles an hour, you know, it sort of reminds me when we, we, I was talking to Mel Stoudemire, sending him out and say, you know, empty your tank here. You know, not that that's what they said to Schilling because he was mm -hmm. expecting to go back out there. But that's what it looked like he was doing. But isn't there another <clears throat> consideration? He's also thinking about a possible game seven. Sure. And if I can save him a lot of pitches here, if I have to use him again. Well, and that's eventually what happens. Schilling starts game seven. But again, it comes down to the trust factor. You're not taking him out of this game unless you trust the guy you're bringing in. Hmm. Okay, so now with Schilling officially out of the game, here's a look at the starters' lines. Schilling went seven, allowed three hits. Only the Shane Spencer homer hurt him. You see the strikeouts as well. And even though Hernandez was in and out of trouble, unlike the Yankees, the D-backs had guys on the bases all night long. The only time they scored was on a solo homer by Grace. Yeah, the high wire act. It was, uh, it was remarkable. When you look at the final numbers, it certainly isn't indicative of the way he pitched. Only time they scored off Hernandez. They got the two off Stanton after Hernandez had left the game. So now we head to the bottom of the eighth where Byung Young Kim is on the mound and Shane Spencer, who had homered earlier off Schilling, leads off. And Tim, you and Joe Buck will discuss the merits of Bob Brenly's decision. Let's listen. Bob Brenly has made a lot of decisions in this postseason. One of them, in our opinion, worked out extremely well. Kurt Schilling starting on three days rest here in game four. This is a decision that I do not agree with. Well, if you're the Yankees, it's an interesting decision by Bob. If you're the Yankees, you're glad to see Schilling out of the game. However, if you're Bob Brindley, you're thinking about Game 7. And I know your point. Forget what? Game 7. Look at that. I forgot we said that. <laughs> if you're leading 3-1 to one in Game 4, and you've got Schilling rolling. He's right. thrown 88 pitches. He threw 98 miles an hour to David Justice last yep. inning. Yep. Get the game here in game four. You've got Randy Johnson waiting for game six. There may be no game seven. Well, did uh, you and Joe patch it up? <laughs> <laughs> Joe has that, as you know, Bob, when, when the camera's not on you, uh, Joe has that, that funny way of looking at you if you, if you happen to disagree with it. And we disagree an awful lot because we, we, we try to uh, get it right, and sometimes we have varying opinions. But, uh, but Joe's a very funny guy, as we all know. Well, again, when you're talking about, I know you talk about pitch count, but it's really not indicative when you're talking about postseason, you know, and all the oxygen you're expelling. And, and I mean, it's, there's a lot of emotion that, that takes a lot out of a pitcher aside from the pitch count. One of the worst inventions in baseball history was that clicker about 60 years ago where pitching coaches click and count pitches. Got it. One away. Two out. Back to back strikeouts of Spencer and Brocious with Soriano coming up. Now, BK Kim in this inning is going to begin, at least to appear to justify, Brenly's decision. Well, he, you're going to see some bad swings in this inning. And remember, the Yankees haven't seen him before, and he's got a lot of deception in his delivery. In fact, Tino Martinez is watching this inning on the clubhouse TV, and that will come into play. Young Hun Kim is one strike away from striking out the side here in the eighth inning. Picking up for Schilling, who oh, wanted great. to go back out there, and Kim, who has yet to appear for tonight in the World Series, isn't phased at all by this as he has run the count full to all three hitters he has faced here in the eighth inning. That was the other unknown. You didn't know how Kim would respond. That's right. Coming out of the bullpen with that long of a layoff at Yankee Stadium for the first time in the World Series. And boy did he respond. Struck out. Three and one the operative numbers that's the score and it's what you're looking at in the series if you can't rally in the ninth. Yeah I mean that's uh, it's devastating and not the fact that we're playing game five at home the next night but the fact that the next two days uh, after that you're going to have to play in Arizona if you expect to win where you got your rear ends kicked in the first two games. Mm -hmm.
All right, so the situation, three outs away from taking a 3-1 series lead are the Diamondbacks, but there are some last-ditch heroics to come from the Yankees on MLB's 20 Greatest Games. Ramiro Mendoza set down the Arizona Diamondbacks in the top of the ninth, so it remains 3-1. to one. B.K. Kim back to the mound to try to finish it off. He had struck out the side in the eighth. Derek Jeter leads off in the bottom of the ninth for the Yankees. 3-1 Arizona. So Derek's going to try to bunt here just to First bring the pitch. tying run to the plate. A good bunt. But Matt Williams is on it. Yeah, I mean, he's try to, he has to try to get on base because his at bat doesn't mean anything unless the next guy represents a tying run. First time the Yankees saw this pitcher and Kim, first time we had seen him, and he was just flat out nasty. He really was. And he throws from underneath where the ball, uh, you know, has a little bit of an upshoot attached to it. <laughs> and Joe, I imagine this at bat has got to bring back some memories. You bet. Paul O'Neill. The year before. Not only here, but the year before, exactly. Ninth inning against the Mets, trailing. That was a, that at bat against the Mets was a 10 pitch war. This one turned out to be seven. Boy, you good. I mean, that's, just, <laughs> that's just what I was thinking. That Benitez at bat where he where he gets a walk against the Mets in game one. And then watching Paul O'Neill, who's, I mean, George Steinbrenner named him the warrior. And this is the reason, because you have to fight to get him. So now, in fact, the tying run comes to the plate first in the person of Bernie Williams. Well, you know, now we have a shot. You know, now a, a stray pitch and a, you know, a bomb, and we're 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 tied and we're at home. We have the advantage. Here's an 0-2. Two. two out as Williams strikes out. That is four strikeouts for Byung Hun Kim. That slider disappeared to Williams. Really did. Now, I, Joe, I think the Yankee crowd is a little worried at this point because. Most of them are sitting down. I'm so used to them standing up in the ninth inning of close games. Well, we're used to winning four straight. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, we've had that. We won four. We won uh, four out of five against the Mets. We won four straight the year before, and uh, four straight the year before that. So they're seeing something they really hadn't seen before, Tommy. You know, where somebody's got the upper hand on us, and here we are, two out in the ninth inning, and and Tino Martinez. And in all fairness to Tino, he's really struggled in the postseason. Until the home run he hit off Mark Langston in, in 98. He mm -hmm. hit the grand slam off Mark Langston. Otherwise, he was really coming away empty, and I think that really got him going and uh, put him in a good spot. That was after that 2 2 pitch, yeah. a big call, ball three to, to, uh, to have a full count instead of a. I thought it was a perfect call. <laughs> Now, you had said that Martinez was back watching Kim work in the eighth and pick something up. Well, again, you're talking about a team that's never seen a guy throw before and has deception in his delivery. He's trying to get a read, and he can get a better read off the video than he can in the dugout. And what he sees is everything's pretty much hard. Now, he did throw a few of the breaking balls there, but Tino steps into the batter's box thinking, He's going to throw me something hard, and I'm going to jump on it. I'm not going to take a pitch. Anything hard, that's what I'm looking for in my wheelhouse. I'm going to take a rip at it. Not just put the ball in play, not work the count. Something hard, I'm going to take a big swing. That's all good, but if you want to talk about odds and history, oh, yeah. what the Yankees <laughs> faced at that moment, and then remarkably what they would face again the next night in Game 5, all right, in the history of the World Series. Now, that includes several years subsequent to 01, but in the history of the World Series. When a team trails by two or more runs, going to the ninth, their record is 6 and 414. When they trail by exactly two runs, their record is 6 and 113. And it was only four wins prior to the 01 World Series because you guys did it twice. Yeah, well, I didn't mention it to Tino when he went up there. <laughs> you didn't know. You didn't know. <laughs> well, Tino doesn't have a hit. I mean, you entered the inning, you scored four runs in the entire series. We, we didn't get hits in batting practice in the early part of this series. Trust me. All right, so here it is. Yankees down to their last out, as improbable as it may be. Tino Martinez at the plate. <laughs> So now it's the tying run at the plate in the person of Tino Martinez and the Diamondbacks are one out away from taking a three games to one lead in this 2001 World Series. Game five tomorrow night. Messina and Batista. One on two out. Martinez hits one to deep right center field.
All of Kurt Schilling's good work up in smoke tie game Yankee Stadium erupts uh, from, a, from a technical standpoint if you're going to hit a, a guy who throws a heavy sinker uh, to home plate you've got to have power to center field and Tino Martinez uh, a power to right's not going to help you because you're not going to get a pitch to pull so Martinez hitting it straight away tough part of Yankee Stadium in which to hit it out and he gets all of it and, and all those people that weren't on their feet are on their feet right now. Joe, I'm sure you remember, it was so loud, partly because that came from nowhere. There was no sense of anything building towards this moment. It was a shot in the dark, literally. And I saw Paul O'Neill when he rounded second, heading for third, where he was not sure. He, he, he really, it wasn't really a dance step, but he was pumping his fist and trying to jump at the same time, and it was <laughs> remarkable. So now you get Mariano up. Oh, yeah, that that's... Uh, the game's in our court right now. So Kim walked Posada. Now this should end the inning, but Council slips and can't make a play, so Justice is aboard. And you got Shane Spencer, who had homered earlier in the game, coming up. Brenly will stick with Kim. You almost have to stick with Kim right here because, I mean, he's the best you have. You bring him in in the eighth inning to pitch two innings. You have to stay with him right here. At this point, Kim, as I understand it, spoke no English. So Miller goes to the mound, or Brendley goes to the mound, or Welch, the pitching coach, goes to the mound. What are they talking about? Yeah, it, lo it looks good. <laughs> it's, like, it's like most meetings on the mound. You know, they say there's a universal baseball <laughs> language. You just kind of, with nods and body language, you know, right? Yeah. Well, I, I had an experience. We had Duque. Uh, and we had, let me see, we had, uh, we had Duque and Arabu, I think it was, and both of them had interpreters, and I think it was in 98, hmm. and I'm looking down the right field line during our workout day, and they're talking to each other without an interpreter around. And I'm saying, how is this happening? So, so you got the Cuban guy and the, and the Cuban Japanese guy, guy and, Japanese and no guy interpreter conversing with each other. And I'm saying, look at these. They're both playing us for fools. <laughs> I think Joe's best line about any pitcher uh, that I've ever heard was about Phil Necro, the knuckleballer. Joe said, I couldn't hit him. I couldn't catch him, and I can't manage him. <laughs> <laughs> but you could understand him. He <laughs> did speak English. <laughs> well, maybe not, not all the time. <laughs> After nine now, going to extra innings, tied at 3-3, back with the conclusion of Game 4 of the 2001 World Series and the birth of Mr. November. Next. Mariano Rivera takes over for the Yankees, or Mr. Automatic. The 2-2 from Rivera. Broken back. Another one for the pile. And Jeter takes care of Council. One out base is empty, the 0-1 pitch. Another broken bat. That's easy. Two out. Two out, nobody on. Danny Batista trying to deliver for Arizona. 3-3 in the top of the 10. Up the middle, one hop. Good pick up by Soriano hitting over. So leaving their bats in splinters, one, two, three for Rivera in the top of the tenth. Now you guys have a chance to win it. BK Kim's going to go back to the mound. He may be shell shocked already, but he's going back. He's going back. I thought he recovered, you know, fairly well, uh, but he is going back, and you know, we, we feel pretty good about it right now. My concern at this point in time, I, I had pitched Mariano the night before two innings. Mm -hmm. And now here we are knowing that uh, he's going to stay out there until he can't pitch anymore. Just uh, for our information, if it goes to 11, and we're not trying to, everybody knows what happens anyway. If, if they you do? Go to, if we, if you, well, if you go to 11, who's going to be was. the pitcher? Uh, Mariano, if he, you know, if he's not gone by then, as far as walking up in the clubhouse, and the fact that he had an easy top of the tenth made the decision a little easier. You know, maybe. right now, if you're going to wear yourself out, you got to keep from going down three games to one at home, and and so uh, I'm going to let him make that call unless we see something that tells us that he's forcing it at this point in time. When you see these pitchers day in and day out. You know, you have a, you know, you have a feel for their body language. I feel badly giving it away. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Barring all that, though, you're going to go with Rivera as long as you possibly can, even if that means he's not available for Game Five, because you got to win this game. Yeah, I can't worry about Game Five if we're down three games to one. All right. Well, perhaps you don't have to worry about this because <laughs> now, as we go to the bottom of the tenth, 
BK Kim on the mound. It's his third inning of work, and Scott Brocious leads it off. Now, Brocious gets a hold of one here, but he's thinking, you know, maybe I'll wait till tomorrow night. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the interesting part because I was questioned about the next night about pinch hitting for him. And you remember this, this foul ball? This foul ball, I remember. And my only concern with a right hand hitter against Kim is he getting a good look at him? Can he see it? Is he going to get tricked? So. And, and I think that's what's happening, Joe, is that all these three ball counts, and the more he's out there, the more pitches the Yankees are seeing, and they seem to get a better read on Kim. The longer these innings go by. Here's a fly out to right, but by the time this night was over, Kim would have thrown more than 60 pitches out of the bullpen, even though he was well rested coming in. He threw 60 pitches in this stint. And that was a season high. I, and again, you're in the World Series, you're going to push your guy. And again, Brenly, this is his man, and he's going to leave him out there. Soriano flies out, second out, two out, nobody on, Jeter. And these chimes mean. It is November. For the first time in the history of Major League Baseball, playing the World Series during the month of November. Mark Grace is about halfway at first base, but Jeter can pepper that line, particularly with two strikes. He goes to right field with two strikes on it. Three and two. Paul O'Neill on deck. He showed you Swindell getting loose in the Arizona bullpen. Two out bases empty. Cheater down the right field line, slicing foul. Somebody has to be. Somebody will be at the end of the night. If only for one day. Three balls, two strikes, two out, nobody on, and Young Hun Kim trying to send this game to the 11th. Credit Kim with settling down enough after that. Deflating home run to get out of the ninth. He's taking care of the first two here in the tenth. Jeter hits it into right. Back at the wall. Game over. Yankees win and the series is tied. That shot a moment ago was of Jerry Colangelo, the owner of the D-backs then. And in a moment, you're going to see Jeter embraced by Torrey. And they were ready, Mr. November. The clock struck midnight, both literally and then figuratively for the D-backs. Dick Sisler was the hitting coach for the St. Louis Cardinals back in the late 60s. And he made a comment one day, and, and I didn't think anything of it. He said, if you foul off enough pitches, you'll finally get what you want. And that's always stuck with me. And I think in that at bat for Derek Jeter, he fouled off enough pitches to finally get what he wanted. And remember, we really didn't see the number of pitches that he did foul off. And, yeah. and they were all to right field. Right. So you, you were a prophet, Mr. McCarver. <laughs> well. and, and Joe, that wasn't just a high five. It wasn't a fist bump. That was a very tight hug you put on Derek Jeter. Well, he saved our lives. He saved our bacon. You know, all the decisions that I was going to have to make, uh, he took me off the hook. And... Again, he's been such a big player from the first time that we came together in 96, getting big hits after big hit after big hit, and, and the fact that uh, everybody really relied on Derek, and, and it was, uh, it was a quite an emotional night with everything leading up to it with 9-11, you know, with the week without baseball, you know, the, the, the start of the postseason. It, it, was, a, it was a draining time. But uh, it was it was so uh, it was so satisfying. Now, of course, there are World Series games scheduled for early November if the series goes long enough. But then, because the regular season was halted for a while after 
This was uncharted territory. As Joe Buck said, when the clock struck midnight, that was the first time any meaningful baseball game had ever been played after November, or and, in November. You know, we, we made the first hit count. In November, uh, there'll never be another first hit in November. <laughs> was, that that, that was one was really darn good. I was talk, impressed by the fan who came prepared with yeah, like Mr. November yeah. sign. So right. talk, talk about a sense of timing and drama, <laughs> not not just not just into the wee hours of the morning, but almost as soon as the clock strikes midnight, boom. And it was and it was handled perfectly by the Yankees, as they uh, often do, with the gong coming out. I mean, how, how much more can you add to the drama than that? Joe, I remember it was about an hour, two hours after the game, I was out in the players' parking lot, and the players were still hanging around with their families. It reminded me of kids after a Little League game waiting to go get an ice cream cone where they couldn't stop talking about the game. And it kind of hit me that as many as amazing wins have you had in the postseason, this one even, they amazed themselves with the way that this game was won. The euphoria lasted so long after that game. And then to think the next night, that lightning would strike in exactly the same position, down to Scott Brocious up at the plate, hitting a home run to rescue you from another loss. It cannot happen, but it did. Well, you know, you're sitting there, and you know you're down by two runs, but you know this couldn't happen again. Uh, and then all of a sudden it does, and, and, you know, of course I could feel Zim bubbling next to me. It, it was just surreal because you, you, you thought you were ha having an out-of-body experience at this point. Even though you spent a life in baseball, and even though you know the realities of the game, you had to feel, all things considered, especially after Game 5 when Brocious duplicated what Martinez had done, that there was an element of destiny here. Oh, yeah. I, I just felt it was ours. And I, I have, you know, we wind up obviously losing the World Series, but I have never been involved. And, of course, it all happened with the Yankees, six World Series. I have never been involved with a better World Series with the drama the ability, two teams, you know, one the underdog, even though they had a lot of veteran players, and our ball club coming off winning three in a row, you just felt you were supposed to do this. Well, we could have tossed the next night, game five, into the list. It didn't make the list. The Yankees won again in almost unfathomable fashion, took a 3-2 lead to Arizona. The D-backs blew you out in game six. Game 7 does make the list, though, Tom. So we'll be back with these same two guys. You can change clothes if you'd like to try and fool people. <laughs> but we're going to do another one of these for Game 7. It's not the next one on the list, but it's somewhere high on the list. For, for yes. the fans out there, just look at this game again. That's what happened in Game 5. Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty well, close. I, when you look back in this game, and now you've seen it again, I'm curious for both of you, what's the moment, what's the story, what's the time that really has stuck with you from this game? When I say Game 4, 2001 World Series, we all remember Derek's home run, Mr. November. But for each of you, what, what sticks? Well, to me, it's Tino's home run. Uh, yeah. Tino's home run. I mean, that, that took, uh, as you had mentioned earlier, everybody was sitting pretty much on their hands at Yankee Stadium, even in the dugout. And, and to have, uh, with one swing of the bat, have the whole personality and the whole uh, conclusion of a game just be affected by the one swing at a bat from Tino Martinez, who came over in 96 as a replacement for, for Don Mattingly, was not a popular player early on to mm. have him hit one of the most memorable home runs in, in Yankee history. Going up, looking for one pitch, getting it, and, and hitting it to the deepest part of the ballpark. One of the most memorable homers in Yankee history, one of the most memorable games of the last 50 years. It was number 12 on our countdown. We will see these guys again, and we hope we'll see you again for number 11 next time. And the 3-2 pitch. Swung on a drill to right field. Going back Sanders. On the track. At the wall. See ya! See ya! See ya!